Hi, I'm Sensei Tony, and this is another one of my Dharma educational videos. I have a very special guest today, uh, Steve Tyson, who is my, I guess you'd say godson, but I like Buddha's son. And Steve is uh, completing his doctorate in educational leadership and is also a hip hop artist and educator. And we're going to be talking today about Neil Tyson's new book, Astrophysics for People in a Hurry. And as most of you know, I've devoted my life to trying to bring the two worlds of science and spirituality together in conversation so that how things work and why they matter uh, are not divorced, but are brought together in a new union that produces a stronger offspring. So we're going to be talking about his new book, but especially the last chapter, where Neil kind of collates his ideas around what he calls the cosmic perspective. Now, I thought the ideal person to interview me for this would be Steve, because he is also Neil's nephew. And so he knows Neil well, and so I thought that way the perspective would be more authentic. So, so we're just going to go from here. We're going to... Talk about different sections in the that chapter, and I'm going to respond. I'm going to respond from uh, the Buddhist perspective in the 21st century. <laughs> so, Tony, what do you feel about the cosmic perspective? The cosmic perspective. When I so let's start like from Neil's book on how he sees the cosmic perspective first. So, the cosmic perspective is this idea that through the practice of science, we have gained incredible knowledge about the universe and our place in the universe. And, and that knowledge has opened us up to a, a larger perspective. And I think that's kind of uh, the gist of, of what Neil, uh, his idea of that perspective is. But I think he takes it one step further in that, you know, we go from this idea that the universe is, you know, 14 billion years old, there are billions and billions of stars in the galaxy, and our galaxy is only one of billions out there. And, it, it, and then it also gets into the study of genetics and atomic structure and the very small, you know, like subatomic physics. But you get this idea that um, everything is interconnected. And I think Neil's thrust that I get from him anyway is the idea that by having a cosmic perspective, it actually can be a way to make our lives better. So, um, in the early part of the chapter, he says, well, you know, this cosmic perspective, you know, is it, is it relevant to someone who's homeless, for example? Is it relevant to someone who's just struggling to sort of meet their basic needs? And I would say that it is. Um, and I, I think he would agree, too, although that statement would be always with the, you know, the understanding that those needs, of course, are vital and important too. But I think overall he would say that that perspective gives us an angle which does change things. So for example, when we first started the Apollo missions into space and landing on the moon, there was that picture of the Earth rise. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and no human being had ever seen the Earth you know, in reality from that perspective. And it wasn't long after that that the ecology movement was born. And, you know, there was a time, I remember too, like people would litter. I mean, it, it might blow your mind now, but people would just wind their window down and throw their garbage out the window. They still do it in Philadelphia. <laughs> they, still, they still do it in Philadelphia. Okay. Well, you know, terrible. back then that was kind of like all the highways were littered, you know, with stuff. And, you know, there was this movement that began then. And then we began to, to think about the environment. And so things like DDT were outlawed and things were changed and we started to, the catalytic converter was created. So it really did change our lives in a better way. And I think that that's kind of where he's going from. Um, so how does that end up applying itself to what you do daily uh, yeah. here at Blue Mountain Lotus Society? So that's, that's the real question for me and that is how does having this cosmic perspective which is based in science how does science relate to our practice of spirituality? So when you think about the history of how this came about, there, there was a time when 
religion and science or science and spirituality um, weren't necessarily together because there wasn't a sense of science like we have today. But the, the church or the organized religions, they were in control of everything. And so they had the greatest amount of power. And so there were struggles early on with what became known as the natural philosophers with that authority. And over time, and I think it goes back to personally the, the bubonic plague in Europe, I think at that time, um, whenever all those folks were dying, they first kind of looked at it in theological terms, like are we being punished by God for something? So the first response was to try to go out there and sort of, you know, um, appeal to God to end it and try to figure it out from that angle or perspective. And when that wasn't happening, people began to say, well, maybe there's something else, another way we can go about solving this problem. And I think those folks began to look at the natural world for answers. Now, most of those folks were very spiritual or religious at that time. A lot of the really <coughs> science-oriented people were monks mm -hmm. in, in, in religious orders. But they, there was this uh, growing sense that they could kind of figure things out by looking at the natural world. And that gave rise to what they called the natural philosophers. And the natural philosophers sort of morphed into what we would call uh, science today. But there was a divorce then between the two. And I think over the centuries that became uh, even stronger as science grew in knowledge and the technology we use to do science grew. A lot of the questions that used to be answered by religious authorities we could now answer with science. So I think there was this divorce that occurred between how things work, which is sort of the magisterium of science, and why they matter, which is this magisterium of spirituality. And so what my work is about is to try to bring those two together so that how things work and why they matter are joined in a new union that can produce stronger, as I often say, stronger offspring. So for me, when I look at it as a Buddhist teacher, our whole faith tradition is based on the cosmic perspective. So in our mythos, or our narrative story, uh, Shakyamuni Buddha goes on this you know, spiritual quest, and the, you know, the, the climax of his quest is the one night where he's sitting under a, a tree and he's looking up into the stars, and right before dawn, he sees the morning star, which is the planet Venus. And he looks up there, and he has this explosive experience where suddenly his mind is opened up into a new, a new perspective, and that was a cosmic perspective, you know. And in our liturgy, we say, you know, the Buddha looked up and said, look, that's me shining so brightly. Hmm. So there was a sense of identity with the universe not being out there, but also being in here. Mm -hmm. I am the universe, the universe is me. And so when you look at like your uncle's perspective, like he talks about being in the planetarium, right? And when the lights went dark and he saw the stars on the ceiling, he had a sense of that cosmic perspective. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's the same thing in essence, because what we're doing is we're, we're, we're seeing a bigger perspective that the, the universe is no longer something that is purely alien or strange or other. So what are some of the ways that you've been able to get more of a, a tangible marriage of the two sure. um, in some of the practices that you do? Sure. So one of the ways I do this is that when I'm teaching uh, about the, the, the Dharma, we call it Dharma, which are the practices, I always do it within the context of the scientific knowledge that we have now. So for example, um, I'll start back to the beginning of the point, the point of singularity where we believe the universe began and talk about how over time, you know, there were all these, uh, you know, we, we had these uh, elements like helium and hydrogen, mm -hmm. which are invisible and they have no smell, and you can't touch them. And yet these are the two basic sort of building blocks of the universe. And you go from hydrogen and helium to Hepburn and Hendrix. You know, to me, that, that's a miracle. 
you know, to start with that kind of understanding and end up over here. Mm -hmm. That process is miraculous. And so we look at the way that, that on this planet anyway, creatures went from being conscious. So that even like, if you're, uh, you know, it's summertime, you're having a picnic, you know, what do you have to watch out for? Flies, right? And then when you try to swat a fly or hit it, it seems to, you know, almost know before you go where, where it's going. But it has this instinct to survive. Mm -hmm. And so I think that uh, as we have evolved, uh, we evolve out of these uh, accumulated evolutionary adaptions and mutations, and that allowed us to survive to get where we are. But we went from being conscious creatures to being self-conscious creatures. Mm -hmm. And that self-consciousness may be the thing that separates us from other animals. We don't know. We can't really talk to them yet. They might be a lot more self-aware than we think. But what we do know about humans is because we have these large frontal neocortex, uh, we have the ability to be, to be self-conscious. And when that came about in our ancestors, we're not really certain. Some people think maybe as far back as a million years ago, some people think maybe 500,000 years ago, but at some point, our ancestors became aware of the fact that they were going to die. That in some sense, too, they were not the same as the rest of the animal world. I love the stories of the Australian aboriginals, and they talk about the dream time. And the dream time is when the human and animal world were one. But then there's this point where the humans left the dream time it became kind of human. And I think that those ancient stories, the aboriginals probably being some of the oldest, um, tell us that there, there was even a conscious sort of looking backward at when we were just conscious like animals. And then suddenly we became self-conscious. So that was a gift to us, but at the same time, it was the birth of anxiety. Because now we knew <laughs> what was coming. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, all, all this anxiety was created. I often think of this, this uh, primal human, you know, stepping outside the cave and looking out and having this, like, awakening and being like, damn. <laughs> <laughs> right. So that led us to a place where we began to try to find a way. You know, we started this, this duality was created between us and the world. And so we began to feel alien in the world. And so we tried to find ways to overcome it. And I think the reason that the first creatures that humans seemed to worship or create totems around were other animals. Uh, bear, bear clans and bear, um, uh, bear totems were the first that we know of in history where they began to associate the bear as a sacred animal and somehow being connected to that animal connected us to this idea of a spiritual world which may have come out of our dreams, it may have come out of uh, hallucinogens that humans were experimenting with. But we end up being these very anxious, self-conscious creatures who essentially feel like they have to have some, they want to reconnect to that other. And so how they did that was by imagining first that the uh, trees and the mountains and everything had a sort of a spirit, mm. what we call animism. And then that kind of evolved into the idea of gods. And that these were very powerful beings, usually connected to powerful nature symbols like lightning and so forth. And that we could, by being connected to these deities, we could overcome that fear of separation mm. and be connected. And that's kind of the history of religion as it went through its different permutations. What's, what's unique about Buddhism is that the Buddha's perspective uh, from that first experience that he had, you know, according to the story under the Bodhi tree, is that there was a moving from self-conscious awareness into what we call a universal consciousness, which to me is another way of talking about the cosmic perspective, mm -hmm. that you're, you're seeing everything is interconnected now. You're not separate. And the idea that you're separate is a delusion. And that the separation is where all the anxiety and all the neurosis comes in. Because I don't think you are me. You're something else. Mm 
-hmm. And so the only way I can, you know, connect to you is either through love or through power. And so those are the two ways that people kind of vacillate in their relationships. And the idea of awakening to this inherent sense of oneness, overcoming that sense of separation, is through developing that cosmic perspective.